Now I've got my new shifter built, I've been able to put a few more hours into trying out a bunch of different driving games. Out of everything I've tried so far, Dirt Rally 2 is my favourite, but I haven't been able to give Assetto Corsa a proper try. Unfortunately, my old Logitech wheel just doesn't play nicely with it as the force feedback ends up oscillating back and forth completely ruining the driving experience. Simulator wheels have come a long way since this one was built and I'd really like to try out a direct drive wheel. So today, we're going to build our own. The first step we need to make is to choose a motor for our wheel and I think I have just the right thing. I've collected a couple of old hoverboards from Facebook Marketplace over the past couple of years so I could harvest their batteries for my projects. So I have quite a few of these hub motors here. They are pretty slow spinning since they usually drive a wheel directly, but because of this, they have bucket loads of torque, which is exactly what we want for a force feedback wheel. I actually first thought of this project a few years ago and when I did some research at the time, I found a few other people on various forums thinking along the same lines, but hardly anyone had it working properly yet. So imagine my surprise when I started working on the project again for this video to find it's all been worked out for us. FF Beast is a firmware that can be flashed onto a variety of motor controllers and allows them to function as a force feedback device. All we really need to do is connect the motor up to the controller and attach an encoder for measuring the wheel position and then we're in business. I've picked up the MKS X-Drive Mini as it was one of the cheapest options, setting me back just 50 Australian dollars, and it even includes a magnetic encoder built right into the board. I later realised I can't actually make use of the inbuilt encoder, but it was still the cheapest option, and with the addition of a standalone magnetic encoder, we can simply use a magnet positioned in the middle of the motor's axis to measure its rotation. But there's a catch. Because this is a hub motor, only the outside of the motor spins, so how are we going to attach the steering wheel to the motor whilst also having a magnet on the centre of rotation for the motor controller? The official build guide suggests drilling a hole down the middle of the motor shaft and passing a thin metal wire through and attaching a magnet at the end. I don't really love this option because the motor wires have to run in the same hole and the rotating shaft could eventually rub through the insulation and short them out. I'm sure it's good enough in the short term, but I want to see if I can do something better. And since there's already plenty of tutorials on how to make this work with minimal tools, I decided to take a different approach and see just how neat I can make this. Before I was on YouTube, I spent a lot of time building and flying drones, so drone motors immediately sprung to mind. They are pretty similar to a hub motor, but instead of the bearings being part of the motor bell with a fixed shaft attached to the stator, the bearings are housed in the stator and the bell rotates with the shaft itself. This would make it so much easier to attach the magnet and would probably also mean I can make the whole package smaller and more professional looking. So let's see if we can modify this motor to make it more like a drone motor. First, I need to remove the shaft from the stator. To be able to do this, I also need to cut the plugs off the motor wires and feed them back through the shaft so that they are out of the way. I'm also going to cut the Hall Effect wires right back to the sensors as we'll no longer need them. I tried to bash the shaft out with a hammer, but it was stuck in there pretty well, so I used my dad's arbor press to press the shaft out instead. This left me with a nice 17mm hole to pass a shaft through. Next, I need to somehow attach a shaft to the bell of the motor. To do this properly, I really need a lathe. Luckily, I know a guy, and with a six pack of Australia's primary currency in hand, he was more than happy to help out. First, we machined the inside of the motor bell to remove the bearing pocket along with the bearing. Then we flipped the part around and machined a flat section on the outside of the motor where I bolted a 12mm thick bit of aluminium plate to bulk up the front of the motor. Next, we bored a 15mm hole through the plate and the bell and finally cut a keyway through both parts so that the bell has a way to drive the shaft. In hindsight, I think this is the one part of this project I would change, but more on that later. Next, we need to turn our attention back to the stator. Obviously, the hole in the stator isn't going to be big enough for a bearing that can handle a 15mm shaft, so I printed these bearing mounts in PETG that clamp together on either side of the stator instead. It's a bit of an unusual way to do it, but hopefully it'll work. The bottom bearing mount doubles as a mount for the motor so we can bolt it directly to the plate to mount it. Just watch out when you go to finally install the bell back onto the motor. Those magnets are no joke and they'll squash any body parts that get in the way. Ugh, now the motor is reassembled, we need to give it a bit of a tweak just to get the alignment perfect so it doesn't jam on the stator. I started out using a dial indicator to try and measure the high points and then tapping the shaft with a hammer. But after chasing my tail for hours, I discovered that if I simply clamp the front of the bell on the vise and hit the shaft with a hammer, it's much easier to get it right. And that's it. 
This style of motor should be much easier to use for our wheel. And since the back cover is no longer used, the motor may even run a bit cooler. Next, we need to work out how to mount it to a desk. I'd like to try and keep the motor fully enclosed. So I set to work designing a box to mount everything inside. First, I've cut the front and the back panels out of six millimeter marine ply. You could probably 3D print these plates if you wanted to. You'd just have to add some bracing to the inside of the front panel to be able to support the motor without warping. Next, I'm going to use some 2020 extrusion to form the sides of the box. I've tapped the ends of the extrusion to M5 so I can screw straight into them. Now we can mount the motor to the front panel using some long M5 screws. I've already installed some M5 threaded inserts into the back of the printed bearing mount so they have something secure to bolt into. I've used a bit of 15mm steel rod as the new motor shaft and machined the end down to 5mm to suit a 625 bearing, which we will use to mount the motor controller to the back of the motor. It was at this stage the project really started to go off the rails. I noticed the motor was yet again out of alignment and scraping on the stator. To cut a long story short, I added some bearings on eccentric nuts to help support the bell of the motor as I think the front of the bell is too thin to fully support itself with the pull of the magnets and gravity. That's why I was able to get the alignment right when the bell was face down in the vise, because gravity was no longer contributing to the problem. These bearings aren't the ideal option, but they work for now. I think in the future, I'll machine off the front of the bell entirely and replace it with a billet aluminium part. The next step is to install the printed mount for the motor controller. It also bolts back to the extrusion to stop it rotating. The bearing provides all the support, so this part can be very thin. I've also glued a small round magnet to the end of the shaft so the motor controller's built-in magnetic encoder can read the position of the motor. Now for some wiring. I've left a cutout in the back panel for a 92mm fan, an XT60 connector and a power switch which I'll connect up now. The fan probably isn't necessary but I haven't run the motor like this yet so I thought a bit of airflow was probably a good idea just in case. The positive wire of the XT60 connector goes straight into the power switch. Out the other side, the power goes to both the fan and the motor controller. Our negative wire goes straight from the XT60 connector to the fan and the motor controller. The three motor wires we left attached to the motor get attached to the phase connections on the motor controller now. We also need to hook up the included braking resistor to the aux port on the motor controller. I'm going to attach this to the extrusion as it could get quite warm. Before we close up the box, we need to flash the firmware onto the controller. The steps are slightly different depending on which controller you use, but for this one, you just connect it to the computer, hold the boot button, and then connect to the external power. This will make the controller boot up in DFU mode and allow you to flash the FFBeast firmware. Once that's done, simply restart the controller and you'll be good to start configuring the software. It was at this point I realized that you can't actually make use of the inbuilt encoder on this controller with the FFBeast firmware. Luckily, I already had an MT6701 encoder module here, so I repurposed the original controller mount to move the controller to the bottom of the box and then printed a new mount for the standalone encoder that works in the same way. I soldered the wires of the included wiring harness to VCC, A, B and ground on the encoder and then attached it to the mount. With all of that sorted, now I'm safe to finish off the cover for the box so we can start setting this thing up. Since I have access to a fibre laser, I can just cut and fold my own. But if you want to do something like this and you don't have a way to do it yourself, PCBWay can also do sheet metal fabrication. To do so, you'll need to upload a 3D file of your part, a 2D drawing for the profile cutting, and a technical drawing to specify the location and angle of the bends. Then just select your material and any other options you want to include in your part, and away you go. PCBWay are a sponsor of the channel, so make sure you check out the link in the video description for this or any other service they provide. With the cover all folded up, you can see that I've left these corner sections empty. I really didn't want this to just be a big boring black box, so I've 3D printed these corner infill sections in red PLA to make it look a little more interesting. They just attach between the bits of extrusion and should do a nice job of filling the corners in. With the cover bolted in place, now we just need to attach a wheel. I grabbed the cheapest wheel I could find on Amazon and a quick release from AliExpress. The wheel bolts straight up to the quick release and I've made a shaft adapter for the other side of the quick release that finally attaches it to our motor. For a power supply, I picked up this 350 watt, 24 volt mean well unit from AliExpress. It's probably a bit of an overkill, but I struggled to find any info at all on what power supplies other people were running. 
so hopefully this will provide more than enough oomph for a convincing driving experience. Last but not least, we need to mount it to a table. I've left the bottom of the box open so that in the future I can bolt it up to a proper sim rig, but for now I've just 3D printed some wedges to angle the wheel up slightly with a spot where I can just use a clamp to hold it onto the desk. Now it's time to configure the control. First, we need to configure the pole pairs, which is the number of magnets in the motor divided by two. Most hoverboard motors have 15 pole pairs, and I've counted mine to confirm this is correct for my motor. The next parameter we need to set is the encoder counts per revolution. If you're using the same encoder as I am, the correct answer to this question is 4096. I'm going to set the power limit and calibration magnitude to a nice low value to begin with before finally hitting enable force and then save and reboot. After the reboot, the wheel will go through its startup calibration sequence and it will begin to output a controller signal. Open the controller test page and check that the direction of the movement of the wheel matches the output on the screen. If it doesn't, tick the invert joystick output box and save and reboot to confirm it's correct. Next, I'm going to check the force direction by setting a low motion range value. If the wheel resists being pushed past that point, the force is working correctly. If it doesn't, hit the invert force output checkbox and then save and reboot to confirm it's working. Just work your way up in power limit until you are happy with the amount of force. The tuning of the power limit and the braking resistor is a bit of a balancing act, so just take your time and use the FF Beast website as a guide. Now that everything is done, there's only one thing left to do. Let's test it. Despite the setbacks I had with this project, I'm still amazed with the result. With the power set to just 50%, it's already more than I can hang on to with one hand. The motor and controller aren't getting hot at all and the feedback is so much more accurate feeling than with the old Logitech wheel. Since I have no pedals now, I'm using the keyboard to accelerate and brake, so I can really only give this a bit of a try, but I'm already getting much more of a sensation of how the car is responding to the inputs and I can tell this is going to make my attempts at drifting much more successful. Watching the footage back, I can see that the shaft adapter is already starting to fail, so I'll have to replace it with an aluminium one. The table clamps are flexing too, but that won't be a problem once it's mounted on a proper sim rig. I guess I'm gonna to need to make some pedals now so I can give this a proper go. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget to like and comment the video if you've got any ideas for a future project or just feedback for this one. See you all next time.